Hello, in this video I'm going to cover five different techniques for preserving the whites in your watercolour painting. I'm often approached when people see some of my seascapes or sky scenes about how I created the glitter on the water or the, the highlights on the cloud and almost always they assume I've just used some um, opaque white like gouache and that is very rarely the case. Um, I'm not opposed to using opaque colours, uh, certainly in small quantities if that's what it takes to uh, produce a better painting. But generally I prefer to just to leave the paper untouched and that becomes the whitest part of my painting. If you have any other techniques you use or have heard of for preserving the whites in a watercolour painting, please leave them in the comments below. One of the most expressive ways to preserve whites on your paper is to use what's called a dry brush technique. Interestingly, you don't use a brush that is dry, though you tend not to have uh, the brush you know, drippy wet with paint. Um, and the effect you, you're after is to create a broken edge, which can represent things like um, sections of clouds, the foam on water, uh, maybe texture on buildings, and even trees. So we'll pick up some paint on our brush. Um, you can either use the tip of the brush and move it quickly across the surface of the paper. To create this broken edge here, it's a combination of the roughness of the paper the amount of paint in your brush, the speed of the brush, and the angle of the brush, and which parts of the brush are touching the paper. So here, the tip of the brush was touching the paper, so we ended up with quite a sharply defined edge. If I change the angle of the brush, so that it's just the bulb of the brush is touching the paper, you get this broken edge um, on both sides. And you can use this to, a combination of these to create some very interesting um, and believable uh, impressions of ocean scenes. Using the same technique when you're creating clouds, for instance, we can use, again, just these few hairs that are just sticking to the paper. We can use them to create the texture of the, uh, the edge of the cloud. And then we'll fill that in. Just assume this is your, your sky, blue sky here. There's your cloud. Now then you can come in, just clean water or, or a, some other color, and just very lightly, just, you know, my brush still has a bit of color in it, and reverse the process. Now we're, we're moving into uh, painting the cloud with some, some light toned color where we touch the sky, we get a softer edge and um, some of the, the sky color then bleeds into the cloud, helping give it some form. But we also preserve some of these whites by leaving them untouched and, um, and preserving that broken edge, which generally reads like the highlight on the edge of certain clouds. Another time you might use this technique, say you're painting a rock. There's a very simple rock and to give the rock some form, you, you want to move from light tones to darker tones, especially if the light's coming from here, but also you want to leave the rock with some texture. So we can start with a brush stroke like that fill in the rest or create even more texture. But right now this, this will read more like the highlight. Now if the light is coming from here, there's the highlight and there's the uh, sides of the rock without so much light on them. And if we were finishing this, we would add a darker tone down here to give the rock some form and give it a little shadow. There we go. 
other areas you can use this technique. Say you have a rock uh, and it's in the water, something like this, and as the water comes up towards it, you can have white foam around the rock. So that's a very quick way to preserve that. You can also use it if you are creating um, a rock and you want to have a big spray of foam around that rock as the wave hits the rock. Then This is very similar to how we tackle clouds. There's your, there's your, um, the foam, and there's some of the spray around the edge of the rock. Obviously, you know, in in reality, you would also um, maybe create some dry brush on the rock itself. Um, I might make it a bit stronger in tone. I'm not worried about colours here. I'm just trying to give you ideas as to where you can use this dry brush to help preserve the whites um, in your painting. Another way where you can you might use this technique is if you were creating a waterfall and you just very lightly we have some spray down here um, so you very lightly uh, run your brush over the the uh, paper in the direction that you want the white. I'll just throw in a few rocks up here, maybe, maybe down here. And this is a very quick way to create that impression of foam as the water flows down the waterfall or over a rock. It doesn't matter, but it's basically that quick brush stroke um, that leaves behind the white, which is the foam you're trying to create. You can use the same on a river. If you've got a river with glitter on the water, it's a very common way that I use it. Quick strokes like that, and it, it leaves glitter. Either on a river, it can also be... Um, uh, on the scene of the ocean, you know, when the, the light is just at the right angle and you get glitter on the surface of the water. So it's this dry brush strokes that achieves that. And I'll show you, show you quickly a few um, artworks where I've used that technique to create that glitter. Another common method of preserving your whites is to use um, art masking fluid. It's basically uh, latex with a small amount of pigment so that you can actually see where you place it on your paper. The one I use is by Winsor & Newton. There are other brands out there that I'm sure do just as good a job. Um, just some notes to keep in mind is it says not to apply it on damp, and soft sized paper. So damp paper, um, if, you, if you apply it to damp paper, the masking fluid, instead of sitting on top of the paper, will be absorbed by it. And, um, and when you come to lift it, you'll actually damage the paper. The same with soft sized paper. Um, uh, it's referring to the sizing or the glue that's on the surface of the paper that controls how fast or slow um, paints are absorbed into the paper. Blotting paper, virtually no sizing in it, and if you used masking fluid on that, the paper would absorb the masking fluid, and again, you wouldn't be able to remove it without damaging the, um, the paper. Where you'd use masking fluid is if you had a particular subject where you, you had lots of shapes broken up by 
light passages. Something like that, and maybe one more here. And in a scene like this, it's very hard to paint each little shape and get a uniform tone and color all the way across. So here you would use the masking to mask out in the shape of the tree trunk and branches. And then when that was dry, you would very quickly lay a wash over that. Then when that dried, you remove the masking and you can paint whatever you still, you know, whatever details you still like to paint on the tree. A while ago, I did a painting of uh, an Australian ghost gum and there was a lot of detail in the trunk and branch structure of the tree with blue sky in the gaps. So for, for that, it made a lot of sense just to use masking fluid. Now, when you're using masking fluid, you don't want to use your best brushes. Uh, the reason for that is if you happen to forget to clean the brush at the right time, the masking fluid will dry in the brush and, and you, you might as well throw it away because there's no way to, to clean that up and retain any sort of point on the brush. So I use some cheap brushes. You want a brush that's a little bit stiffer than an, what I would normally use for my watercolour paintings um, because the, the masking fluid is reasonably thick and sometimes you've got to apply a little bit more pressure to get it off the brush. Now, to protect your brushes, because while they're cheap brushes, you don't want to you know, destroy them the first time you use masking fluid, which I did when I first started. Um, so I have a process, and that process involves a, a water container and a little squirt of dishwashing liquid, and then maybe about half an inch of water. The amount's not critical. Um, and then you stir that up. There we go. The other thing too, uh, some masking um, fluids recommend um, stir, you know, shaking the bottle before you open it. If you do that, I recommend you do it about half an hour before you um, open the bottle so that most of the bubbles have had a chance to settle down. All right, so now what I do is I dip my brush into the soapy water, drag out about three quarters of the, the liquid and then dip the brush into my masking fluid. And then we, with the paper totally dry, I paint the shapes that I want to protect. And I usually dip two brushes Two, two brush loads of masking fluid before I go back into the water, soapy water, and clean the brush. That's very important. If you keep going, the masking solution will dry and you will ruin your brush. So after a couple of brush loads of masking fluid, back into the water and then, and then back into the masking fluid. Now, some of the problems with using masking fluid, uh, if you aren't very accurate with your edges, sometimes when you lift your masking fluid, you've got to spend some time adjusting those edges. Other places, you might have a hard edge where ideally you want a soft edge, and, and you can fix that by going in and uh, with a stiff brush and just softening uh, any edges that are too sharp for your final design. But right now, I've, I've put the masking fluid down 
and I have to leave it for about you know, 15 to 30 minutes until that totally dries. So we'll have a little break and then we'll come back and do the next step. The masking fluid's dry now and I can work on the painting. So now instead of just painting each little shape and then trying to somehow get the same uh, tone and colour all the way across, you can just paint straight over And you cover that area very quickly and with a nice clean wash. There we go. Okay, so we'll let that dry and then uh, and I'll show you how to remove the masking. So this is dry now and I can lift the masking fluid. Now if you try to lift it with your finger, you've got to do quite a bit of rubbing. Um, and then you can just start, some people, you know, start peeling it, whatever. But if you get one of these crepe erasers, and this this is about a quarter of the size of a regular crepe eraser. Um, you know, they're normally about this size, but I, I generally cut them into four and then give my students um, two or three of the other pieces because this will last for years and years and years. But you can see straight away how quickly the latex is attracted to it and it just lifts so easily. There you go. It does tend to lift any pencil marks um, or certainly lighten them. Sometimes uh, you've got to keep that in mind because you might need to put the pencil marks back in. So you can see here, I didn't do a good job of the masking. There, there, um, and then this edge here isn't very clean. Here I've probably gone in and left a little bit out. So these are the things you have to fix before you do any further work on the tree. Um, or whatever other shape you have. You, you have. And so usually if I want to make those adjustments, I get a, a stiff synthetic brush like this. This, uh, this is called a bright stiff synthetic. All you want is something that's quite stiff. I dip the brush in water and then take out 90, 95% of the water. And then I can just very lightly scrub and adjust those edges to lift. You want just enough water to dissolve that little bit of paint, but not to, you know, dramatically wet the paper. And then same here, this is a bit too rough. With practice, you, you you get more and more accurate with this, but um, there's almost always something you've got to adjust. That's one of the problems. Sometimes you miss laying masking in an area, and depending on what it is, you either remove it or, or you leave it. And then here, so I've missed quite a bit. We'll just go back down.
There we go. Another little bit here. But that gives you the basic. It's a very valid technique. I do use it from time to time. And when there's a painting that calls for it, you'll be very happy to have it. One of the most common ways of preserving whites is just to paint around the object. In this case, we've got a white sailboat and we're going to have a dark background. The reasons you might do this is because, um, one, you want the sails to remain white or the boat to remain white, or more commonly, you want to put your dark background in and then be able to go in and lightly shade some of these white areas. With watercolour, you have to preserve the lighter areas if you want to then paint over them with a light tone. So with, with an object like this, um, I usually use the tip of my brush to paint around sections of the object and then use a broader section of my brush to fill in the background. You have to paint fairly quickly, otherwise you'll end up with sharp edges where the paint dries. So I'll start with that. That defines the shape of the sails. Then we can come in down here. And we can define the rest of the shape of the boat. Now one of the things that happens when you do this, if you paint around a light object with a dark colour, it tends to make the light object want to come forward. The only challenge with this is um, if the paper dries too fast, you don't end up with a nice smooth finish around the boat, so you have to paint quite quickly. Candle wax can also be used to preserve some of the whites in your painting. Um, some of the areas I've used them in are to retain highlights in rock formations, waterfalls, and waves in water in very simple uh, paintings. Um, it doesn't really matter which uh, candle wax you use. I, I like these bigger ones because I can press and change the pressure that I apply to the paper. Plus some of these broken edges allow me to create some sort of sharper edges. I use cold press paper when I'm using this technique. Um, on rough paper the lines are, aren't as sharp. Um, but it really again it depends on what what your subject is. So if I was creating say a waterfall, maybe some rocks here, this is nothing fancy, and maybe even some spray on either side, I could get the candle wax and there we go, then maybe a little bit of texture on these rocks here and it's something that you you practice it depends on how much pressure you apply what you've got to remember with candle wax however is once you put it on it's there for good you can't you can't lift it you can't iron it off or anything like that so you have to have a pretty good idea of where it should go then once you've placed your candle wax Get some paint. And that 
very quickly shows you the type of effect. Get some rocks up here. And wherever I've put candle wax, whether it be on these rocks, where the water is, it, it stays nice and white. As I said, the only problem is you can't remove that. You can do the same if you have a rock. I covered this on my video on different ways to produce rocks, but, but you can use it to protect the highlights and then you can go in and very quickly paint the rest of the You can also use it to place some maybe stylized birds. In your subject. You can notice here that the the candle marks are quite broad. So you, you're not going to use candle wax um, for very small shapes. It's just too hard to, to control that. I've used it for some very simple paintings when I'm getting students uh, familiar with watercolour and I'd like them to produce a work relatively quickly. So that's one of the techniques. I cover with them. Again, it's not one that I use very often, but it's, it's there as a potential uh, and who knows when you'll be painting a subject and you think oh yeah candle wax is just the thing that I need. Some people find that they can use masking tape to mask out um, in particular uh, geometric shapes that aren't too complex and um, while I don't use this technique all that often it's worthwhile knowing that it is there as an option. Some people can use masking tape to help get a straight horizon. The thing to keep in mind with masking tape, you have to do a little bit of, um, uh, of uh, research because if your tape isn't sticky enough, the um, paint will flow underneath and if it's too sticky or leaves, especially if it leaves a residue, um, then that residue will affect any, any painting you then decide to do over the protected white area. This is quite, a, quite an adhesive tape that I'm using and it seems to do the job well. Um, and I'm using cold pressed paper. The rougher the paper, the harder this, this um, method of masking is to achieve uh, good lines because if you've got paper that's too rough it's hard for the tape to properly ad adhere to the surface of the paper. So I'm just going to put a number of different shapes down here and then we'll quickly paint a wash over the top so you can see the result. There we go. So just tape them down, making sure they're properly stuck to the paper. And now let's mix some colour.
again, this is just an exercise. We don't have to be too particular about which colours we're going to choose. And that should be good enough. Just a quick wash like that. Um, you do have to keep in mind the amount of water that's or paint that's sitting on the the tape surface, because if that then falls, you know, while your your painting is drying, if that falls into the um, the damp mixture of paint and water, you'll end up with a cauliflower. This is just purely an exercise to show you the technique and the results you can get from the technique. Um, again, I don't use this very often. I'm very much a direct artist and probably a little bit impatient to get a result. But um, that doesn't mean that I would never use a technique like this if I thought it was the right one to use. There we go. Now here already you can see that the tape has lifted a little bit, so I probably just didn't press that down hard enough. And I've managed to touch the paper with the tissue, so th these are all things you've got to take into account. Now we'll let that dry and then have a look at the result. All right, let's see how this finished up. That's our horizontal line. Some of these, there's still some wet paint on the top of the tape, so you have to be a little bit careful with that. There we go. And as you can see, it's not a foolproof technique. You, there's always a risk that some paint is going to flow underneath your, um, your tape. And then you can either live with that, depending on what you're trying to achieve with your subject, or you need to get a stiff brush and lift the tape, the paint out. That won't get you back to a pure white piece of paper however, but it can um, it can get pretty good as you can see. That'll do. Anyway. Uh, it's just an idea. Um, it, it, you might find it useful. It's certainly um, workable for for some people who, if they have, you know, a lot of trouble getting that straight edge in the horizon. Personally, I don't mind if I get the odd little bump, but if if you want it crisp, crystal sharp like that, then um, the tape might be something you can use. If you've enjoyed this video please subscribe and hit the notification bell if you haven't already done so 
and hit the like button. It helps the development of my channel. See you for the next video.